In this video, we're going to do an introduction to the peripheral portions of brain anatomy, meaning we're not really getting into lobes or specific brain regions internally, but we're going to talk about um, the meninges, the blood-brain barrier, the ventricles of the brain, and cerebrospinal fluid. So the first thing to point out is, remember, brain tissue is not made entirely just of neurons. In fact, um, there are many more supporting cells that we call glia than there are neurons in the brain. So neurons get a lot of attention, that's these guys, because they have processes that actually send signals. Remember, dendrites and axons uh, are forming synapses, and they're obviously critical to the things that the brain does. But all of these other glial cell types are critical too. So as a quick overview, um, brain glia include microglial cells, which are effectively just modified white blood cells. They're like the macrophages of the brain. Um, they're there to prevent infection because brain infections can become catastrophic uh, very, very quickly. The second type, these astrocytes got their names because someone thought that they looked like stars with all these radiating processes. And astrocytes do a lot of things from um, supporting neurons metabolically to make sure that we keep homeostasis in the brain. And also, um, astrocytes are known for forming the blood-brain barrier, which is something that we'll um, talk about more here in a minute. All right, the next type, these ependymal cells, they line open spaces in the brain, uh, and those big open spaces or cavities we call ventricles. And their function in the ventricle is to produce um, cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. So they're basically the gatekeeper between blood and CSF, right? Two of the most important fluids that you find in the brain. And we'll see all these again in a bit in more detail. All right, oligodendrocytes are the myelin-producing cells in the central nervous system. So this is one oligodendrocyte, and then all of the little extensions coming off of it, right? Each of those is producing one myelin segment. So if you want a, um, a review on myelin, go back a little bit in the playlist. I've got an entire video covering uh, myelination and action potentials and how that leads to, um, you know, uh, signaling going down an axon. For right now, we'll just say those oligodendrocytes are wrapping their membranes around axons um, to form that myelin sheath. All right, so we'll see each of these different cell types come up again as we move through the notes. This is just to get the names out there so that you recognize them. All right, next point, um, meninges. Um, the meninges are the connective tissues that surround the brain. So in this picture, we're starting at the exterior up top, this is bone tissue. So this bone could really be any of the cranial bones of the skull that are surrounding the brain. And if we started burrowing down through that bone tissue, as soon as you get through it, um, the first type of connective tissue that you're going to find is something called dura mater. And uh, dura mater is by far the thickest of all the connective tissues around the brain. And its name is actually pretty funny. Uh, dura in Latin just means tough, like durable and mater actually means mother. So dura mater literally translates to tough mother. Um, it's the thick um, connective tissue around the brain that serves as a buffer between brain tissue and bone. All right, underneath the dura mater, um, you get another layer called arachnoid matter. And the easy way to see this arachnoid matter is it has what look like cobwebs coming down out of it. All right, so this is the arachnoid matter itself and all these little strands of connective tissue coming down out of it. Someone thought that it looked like spider webs when they saw it under a microscope for the first time. And so arachnoid, because spiders are arachnoids, it looks like cobwebs, you get the idea. All right, pia matter is the interior most and by far the most uh, thin and delicate of the meninges. That is this layer that you're seeing right here and it is directly contacting brain tissue, right? So in this picture, don't lose context. This is gray matter, right, of the cerebral cortex. So this is cortex, this would be white matter, right? So we are right on the periphery of that cerebral cortex. And um, because of that, we need to bathe that gray matter where all of your cell bodies are in the brain with cerebrospinal fluid, right? So for that reason, this space in between the arachnoid and pia matter right here, this is your subarachnoid space, right? That entire region, everything in here, over here, that subarachnoid space is filled with CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. 
All right, the CSF isn't actually made in the subarachnoid space. Um, we'll get to that in a minute with ventricles, but this is a, a large part of where it winds up. All right, the next thing you'll notice is we have these regions called sinuses, and a sinus is effectively just a hollow, open cavity. Um, sinuses in the front of your skull are filled with air. Those are the ones that can pressurize and give you discomfort when the weather changes. These sinuses are basically open compartments of venous blood, so they act a lot like veins. And what you notice is these arachnoid granulations, there are little extensions of the arachnoid matter into those sinuses, and CSF is leaving the subarachnoid space and entering the sinus to be returned to blood. Right? This will make more sense in a minute when you see that the fluid that we use to make CSF comes from the blood initially. And so the whole idea is we want that CSF to constantly be turned over, right? Make new CSF that's clean and fresh and get rid of the old stuff, right? I know we're doing this a little bit backwards, but I promise it'll make sense. Um, this is the getting rid of the old stuff, right? This CSF has been around for a few hours at this point. It's accumulating metabolic wastes from all the gray matter that it's bumped up next to, and we need to get it back into the blood so that organs like the liver and the kidneys can um, clean it, detoxify it, and then give us fresh um, CSF back again when we get blood coming in from arteries. All right, a little bit about the function of CSF. So the volume, um, 140 mils, that's a decent amount of fluid. If you cupped your hands together like you were about to you know, fill them full of water to take a drink, that's about 140 mils. That's the volume we're looking at. And it's distributed um, across that entire subarachnoid space and in the ventricles. So those ventricles in the brain are the site of production. And what I want you to see is um, in a given day, your ventricles make about 500 milliliters of CSF, but you only have 140 at a given time. That means that we've got a turnover rate, right? Because if there's 140 present and we make 500 a day, that must mean that we're making and reabsorbing the entire volume multiple times every day. So your CSF really only lasts about, you know, six, seven, eight hours, and then you've made a completely new batch at that point. So it's like a slow, steady drip of new fluid all the time. The things this does for you um, are a couple things. One is CSF gives you buoyancy. Remember, a big part of the brain is made of white matter, and white matter, myelin, is made of fat. Um, fats float in water because they're less dense, right? just like oil and water separating. And so your brain is quite literally floating in CSF so that every time you take a step as you walk or your head bobs up and down, your brain is bouncing um, very gently um, in a puddle of cerebral spinal fluid at the base of your skull. That takes a lot of the weight off of the brain so that it's not all just sitting down on the bones in the base of the skull. It's floating in fluid. Next thing, um, impact damage. If you hit your head against something, instead of your brain being immediately right up next to bone, that CSF in the subarachnoid space has to squish out of the way. And so it's kind of like falling into shallow water as opposed to right onto concrete. It's not ideal, and you can still get injured for sure, but it's much better than nothing. All right, and then lastly, the metabolic function. Um, CSF acts a lot like plasma in your blood. It's there to deliver oxygen, clear out waste products, and wash anything that's not really um, supposed to be in the brain anymore back out into the blood so that organs like livers and kidneys can clean up and detoxify uh, any of those waste products and bring new fresh CSF back again later. Okay, so on to ventricles. The ventricles are open cavities that are filled with CSF within the brain. This is showing you a lateral view and this is anterior. So we've got four ventricles in total. Um, the two on the sides that are by far the largest, we call the lateral ventricles. And after that, we start numbering them. So these would be the lateral ventricles, this would be the third, and this would be the fourth. You can think of the lateral ventricles as being a lot like, you know, calling them numbers one and two. It's just, we don't actually call them one and two. We just call them the left and right lateral ventricles, right? And that is where the majority of your CSF is produced. So what ends up happening is um, you make most of your CSF in the lateral ventricles. It then moves into the third ventricle, right, through an opening 
um, that we call the interventricular foramen. Um, it sounds fancy, but don't be fooled by the Latin here. Interventricular foramen really just translates to the hole between the ventricles. And if you zoom in close, they're showing it right here. So all of this CSF would be building up in the lateral ventricles, going through this interventricular foramen right here, into ventricle number three, that's this guy, and eventually um, down this tube called the cerebral aqueduct into ventricle four. Um, same thing on the translation, cerebral aqueduct really just translates to brain water pipe in Latin. So it's not um, as confusing as they make it seem, just trace the flow. Laterals through the interventricular foramen to the third, down the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth, and once you hit the fourth ventricle, now we're back, um, you know, connecting to where we started. CSF is going to leave these openings on the fourth ventricle to head out to the subarachnoid space on both sides of the brain. It's also going to go down the central canal, which is going to lead you to the spinal cord, right? This is exactly why when uh, a neurologist wants to get a sample of your cerebrospinal fluid, they don't have to do you know, a, a tap or a hole through your skull and get into the subarachnoid space there. They can get um, a CSF sample from your lumbar spinal cord because that fluid flows all the way down um, and is recycled down the spinal cord as well. All right, so next thing, um, sinuses, broader view. Uh, this is showing you all the different sinuses of the brain. Their names make sense, right? Superior sagittal sinus because it's in the sagittal plane and superior because it's near the top. Again, these are just large venous structures that are collecting a lot of blood draining off the brain and taking that CSF back in, right? And the flow of these arrows, if you notice, all of them lead back. This is the superior sagittal sinus. Um, this is the inferior sagittal sinus because it sits just a bit lower. And the transverse sinus because it's laterally off to the side of the skull. They all lead you back to this confluence of sinuses and we're not really messing with it too much right now, um, but when you eventually get to cardio and you see the vasculature system that's going on here, this blood is all going to return to the jugular vein that makes its way down to the neck, down to the vena cava, and back to the heart. That's how we're returning all this blood flow um, back into circulation. All right, so let's put it all together. The big picture of this, remember your CSF is in initially being produced in the ventricles, uh, this term choroid plexus, that's just the name for the interface between blood vessels and those ependymal cells that we looked at earlier that are making CSF. So that is the actual site of production. That choroid plexus is within the lateral ventricles. And CSF flows to the third, down into the fourth. And here you can see that connection to the subarachnoid space, which eventually leads us all the way around the brain right next to those sinuses that we just looked at, right? And once the fluid enters the sinus, it's not really CSF anymore, right? We're back to the blood, um, heading out to circulation to get cleaned up, right? Um, this also shows you, remember, there are arteries and other blood vessels, capillaries going through the brain um, all throughout brain tissue. And the astrocytes that you see here, this is the formation of that blood-brain barrier that we talked about before, We'll see that in a bit more detail coming up here in just a minute. All right, so blood-brain barrier. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. You have an enormous amount of circulation, blood, to the brain, and you need a barrier to decide what gets to cross from blood into brain tissue and what doesn't, because your brain is by far the most picky organ when it comes to deciding what is allowed to actually leave the blood. We want to be careful about toxins, about waste products, and especially infections, right? If you get a bacterial or viral infection in the brain, um, it can become bad news very, very quickly. And so these astrocytes, they are acting like a lining to decide what gets to move through and what doesn't, right? And so they very literally wrap their processes around the blood vessel. And the goal is we want to allow nutrients to move in by diffusion, things like glucose and amino acids, um, electrolytes like sodium and potassium, those things should all be able to get through. And um, we need to let a lot of metabolic wastes 
move through because they need to leave, right? The brain is a very highly metabolic organ. It's burning through a lot of nutrients. Um, those waste products have to be able to get out, right? And this also has a big impact on pharmacology. Um, most drugs that are small molecule drugs can get through the blood-brain barrier, but not all of them can. And so there are plenty of medications that probably could have a beneficial impact for patients in their brains, but if it can't cross the blood-brain barrier, then it's not really worth anything because it'll never reach its destination. All right, so wrapping up this um, idea of brain circulation, one thing to remember in all of this, uh, we haven't really talked a whole lot about the arteries that are bringing blood into the brain, but I want to point out um, your brain uses an enormous amount of blood flow and oxygen. Um, brains are about 2% of an average person's body weight, but they get about 15% of their blood supply and 20% of the oxygen and glucose nutrients. So your brain is very metabolically hungry. And the reason is it has to burn through a lot of oxygen to make the ATP that you need to run those sodium potassium pumps that we talked about back in the action potential section. The other thing that you'll notice is um, the brain has a weird anatomical setup, right? So this schematic is showing you what the blood flow on the underside um, of the brain looks like. So this is the internal carotid arteries right here. Those are the major arteries going off the aorta up through the neck. And these are the vertebral arteries that go up your cervical vertebra. And they all feed into this thing called a cerebral arterial circle. Right? And this is odd because most organs just have blood vessels that run in straight lines. A circle is a little bit weird. And the idea is if you have inputs here, right? So both internal carotids feed into the circle. And these two vertebral arteries eventually fuse to make the basilar artery. Um, basilar artery also feeds into the circle, right? And then all of these branch points, right? The middle cerebral and... Um, the superior cerebellar and the posterior cerebral, these are all branches that are going out into different parts of the brain um, to feed those tissues and make sure they have enough oxygen. The thing about the circle is if one side of your brain needs more blood than the other, or if there's a partial blockage somewhere, what you can do is you can vasoconstrict or vasodilate these communicating arteries, right, which form the actual circle itself, and they can reroute blood. So if you need more blood on the left side of your brain at a given moment, you can take some of the blood from the right carotid and route it around the other side of the brain. And so it basically lets the major arteries of the brain sort of share their blood with different brain regions because unlike most organs, um, the brain might have different blood flow to different parts of it at different times, right? Your brain isn't just one big, even uniform computer that uses all of its parts equally all the time, um, different areas might be highly active one minute and then not so active the next minute. This circle helps shift that blood where it's needed most at the right time. All right, hope this video was helpful. Uh, remember, uh, we have a lot more brain anatomy to go into after this. So this was just our introduction to peripheral structures. Um, follow the next video in the playlist and we'll start going through specific brain regions and asking questions about how we assign labels and functions to those brain regions.